chapter one of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa nuchette carey chapter one in the lime avenue thou knowest my old ward here i lay and thus i bore my point four rogues in buckram let drive at me king henry the fourth and i have not forgotten what the inside of a church is made of i am a peppercorn king henry the fourth in this age of transition and progress when the pleasure-seeker like the athenian of old is for ever searching for things new and strange when old landmarks are ruthlessly demolished and respectable antiquities are shelved in outer darkness then to some conservative minds it is refreshing to stumble upon some old world corner fragrant with memories of the past and as yet untouched by the finger of the destroyer cleveland terrace chelsea is one of these spots the cobwebs of antiquity seem to cling with the vines to the tall narrow old houses with their flagged courtyards and high iron gates and small useless balconies there is something obsolete old-fashioned and behind the age in the whole aspect of the place one could imagine some slim demure damsel in a short-waisted gown not long enough to hide the dainty shoes and sandals with a huge bonnet disguising a pyramid of curls tripping down the few worn steps and across the road on her way to join her friends at ranelagh just opposite is chelsea hospital with its scarlet and blue coated pensioners basking in the sunshine grand old veterans who have grown grey with service their breasts decorated with the medals they have won some in a hale green old age others in the sere and yellow leaf toothless senile tottering slowly but surely towards their long home one reads a whole page of history as one gazes at the worn wrinkled old faces ah they have been young once but now the battle of life is nearly over for them the roll-call will only sound once more in their ears let them sit in the sunshine and tell their old stories and fight their battles over again in the ears of some admiring recruit how their dim eyes sparkle with senile enthusiasm there were two of the black devils but i bayoneted them one after another spitted them like larks and served them right too that's where i got this medal and here a fit of asthmatic coughing impedes the bloodthirsty narrative one can imagine the thrilling tales told round the fire towards night as the grim old warriors nestle cosily in the high wooden settle while envious comrades watch them from afar how heavily the poor wooden legs stump through the long echoing corridors gray hairs old wounds the chill stiffness of decrepit age well thank god for their peaceful harbourage where the weary limbs can rest in comfort there is a sweet old spot just where the long lime avenue leads to old ranelagh adjoining the little plots of garden ground cultivated by the pensioners one golden afternoon in september when a fresh pleasant breeze was rippling the limes a girl in brown came down the avenue and as she tripped past the gnarled and twisted tree boles the slanting sunbeams seemed to meet and envelop her until her shabby frock became like cinderella's robe and the green and golden banners overhead were a canopy of glory above her who does not know the beauty of a lime avenue in the early autumn when the very air is musical with faint soughing and every leaf adds its tiny vibrating voice to the universal symphony when children and birds and sunshine and all young living things seem to have their own way and play in unison the girl was coming up from the river in the direction of old ranelagh and she was walking with so light and 
airy a step that one could have imagined it set to music for her feet which were very small and pretty though alas shabbily shod seemed scarcely to touch the ground she was small almost childish in stature with a thin erect little figure and a pale oval face framed in short curly hair and at first sight people always called her plain an insignificant puny little thing that was what they said until they saw her eyes and they were the most wonderful and spirituelle eyes in the world and after that they were not so sure of the plainness for comparisons are odious and there is no hard and fast rule with respect to feminine beauty at least tastes differ and here and there a philistine might be found who would be ready to swear that dark spirituelle eyes brimful of intelligence and animation with a mirthful sparkle underneath were worth a score of pink and white beauties in spite of their fine complexions and golden hair just at the end of the avenue two old pensioners were sitting and at the sight of them and at the sound of their raised voices the girl began smiling to herself then she stepped quietly across the grass picking her way daintily until only a tree divided her from the old men and there she stood shaking with silent laughter i tell you it is a lee jack there were three of them as sure as my name is fergus mcgill look here and here the speaker rose stiffly to his feet he was a tall old man with a long grey beard and the pinned-up sleeve and the filmy look of the sightless eyes told their own tale his breast was covered with decorations and medals and in spite of his high cheekbones his massive almost gigantic figure and grand face would have become an ajax his companion was a short sturdy man with a droll physiognomy his light prominent blue eyes had the surprised look of a startled kitten and he had a trick of wrinkling his forehead as he talked until his eyebrows disappeared and when he took off his cocked hat his stubby grey hair looked as stiff as medusa's crest of snakes wide awake jack was the name by which his mates accosted him in reality corporal marks he too was decorated and had a wooden leg which he found useful in conversation when emphasizing some knotty point he was tapping the ground pretty smartly at this moment as he cut himself another quid of tobacco lees he returned in a huffy voice it is the truth and nothing but the truth and i'll take my oath to that but here a little peal of girlish laughter interrupted him these two old men loved each other like david and jonathan or damon and pythias or like any other noble pair of friends and would have died for each other and yet would wrangle and argue and spar fifty times a day and the chief bone of contention was a certain episode on an indian battlefield half a lifetime before human nature is sadly faulty and even in chelsea hospital there were mischievous spirits and on cold windy nights when old bones ached and there was general dullness and the draughts made one shiver and huddle round the fire then would one or another slyly egg on sergeant mcgill or corporal marks with some such question as this was it three of them sepoys that mcgill bayoneted before he got that sword thrust or only two or perhaps more cunningly and artfully i wish i had nabbed two of those dratted sepoys like mcgill marks can tell that story best two john perks interrupted mcgill wrathfully it was three that i killed with my own hand and the third was so close to me that i could see the whites of his eyes and the devil smile on his wicked lips and i laughed as i ran him through for i thought of those poor women and children and it is the goot english i am speaking for i have forgotten the gaelic i have lived so long in the land of the sassenox not but what the gaelic is milk and honey in the tongue that speaks it when that little mocking laugh reached their ears both the old men reddened like children discovered in a fault then they drew themselves up and saluted gravely but the girl's eyes were full of mirth and mischief 
aren't you ashamed of yourselves you two quarrelling over a silly old battle that every one else has now forgotten one would think you were heathens and not christians at all to hear you talk in that sanguinary style the girl's voice was deep but very clear and full and there was a curious timbre in it that somehow lingered in one's memory it was so suggestive of sweetness and pathos are you very well miss ward ah it is always a good thing when one has the joke ready and sergeant mcgill's tone was full of dignity but it is not quarrelling that we are after miss ward only a little difference of opinion yes i know but what does it matter mcgill how many of those poor wretches you killed but she might as well have spoken to the wind it was three miss ward returned mcgill obstinately and if you had seen the sight that jack and i saw you would not be calling them poor for they were the devil's sons every one of them and their hearts was black as sin and it was the third man that i got by the throat and when jack came up but here the girl shrugged her shoulders and a little frown came to her face yes i know but please spare me those horrible details and then she laughed again but there were tears in her eyes i dare say there were more than three if the truth were known corporal why do you vex him with contradiction if you were in another part of the field how could you know what he did ah it is the goot english that miss ward speaks murmured mcgill but corporal marks struck him hold your tongue mcgill you are like a woman for argifying argol barking as sergeant drummond calls it from noon to night this was how it was miss ward our company was scattered and i found myself suddenly in the corner of the rice field where mcgill was there was a barricade of dead sepoys round him and he had his foot on one of them and had got another by the throat and then but a peremptory gesture stopped him thank you i have heard enough but i am inclined to take mcgill's part for how could you see clearly in all that smoke and crowd come let us change the subject i owe you sixpence for those flowers that you brought yesterday for my sister tells me that she never paid for them no miss ward and there was no sixpence owing at all i left the flowers with my duty ah but that is nonsense corporal returned the young lady quickly i will not rob you of all your lovely flowers it's not robbing miss ward replied mcgill in his soft thick voice it is a pride and pleasure to jack that you take the flowers for it is the goot friend you have been to us and the books you have read and the grand things you have told us and what are roses and dahlias compared to that well well you are a couple of dear old obstinate mules but i love you for it but please do not argue any more good-bye sergeant good-bye corporal and the girl waved her hand and again the old men saluted they are two of the most pugnacious squabbling old dears in the whole hospital she thought as she walked quickly on i wonder which of them is right neither of them will yield the point and then she smiled and nodded to a little group that she passed and indeed from that point to cleveland terrace it was almost like a royal progress so many were the greetings she received and it was good to see how the old faces brightened at the mere sight of the girl presently she stopped before one of the tall old houses in cleveland terrace and glanced up eagerly at the vine-draped balconied windows as though she were looking for some one but no face was outlined against the dingy panes then she let herself into the dim little hall with its worn linoleum from which all pattern had faded long ago and its dilapidated mahogany hat-stand with two pegs missing and an odd assortment of male and female headgear on the remaining ones and then she called out molly molly finishing off with a shrill sweet whistle that made an unseen canary tune up lustily and the next moment another whistle quite as clear and sweet answered her and a deliciously fresh voice said i'm in the studio darling and the girl with a wonderful brightness on her face ran lightly up the stairs oh what an age you have been waveney you poor dear how tired and hungry you must be and here another girl painting at a small table by the back window turned round and held out her arms 
when people first saw molly ward they always said she was the most beautiful creature that they had ever seen and then they would regard waveney with a pitying look and whisper to each other how strange it was that one twin should be so handsome and the other so pale and insignificant but they were right about molly's beauty her complexion was lovely and she had irish grey eyes with dark curled lashes and brown hair was just a dash of gold in it and her mouth was perfect and so was her chin and the curves of her neck but perhaps her chief attraction was the air of bonhomie and unconsciousness and a general winsomeness that cannot be described where is father molly asked waveney but her eyes looked round the room a little anxiously ah i see the picture is gone and then a look of sorrowful understanding passed between the sisters yes he has taken it almost whispered molly but he will not be back yet anne is out she has gone to see her mother so i must go and get your tea noel is downstairs and indeed at that moment it cracked boyish voice could be heard singing the latest street melody and murdering it in fine style molly rose from her chair rather slowly as she spoke and then ah the pity of it one saw she was lame not actually lame so as to require crutches but as she walked she dragged one leg and the awkward ungraceful gait gave people a sort of shock molly never grew used to her painful infirmity though she had had it from a child it was the result of accident and bad treatment a sinew had contracted and made one leg shorter than the other so that she lurched ungracefully as she walked once in the night waveney had awakened with her sobbing and had taken her in her warm young arms to comfort her what is it molly darling she had asked trembling from head to foot with sympathy and pity it means that i am a goose molly had answered but i could not help it waveney i was dreaming that i was at a ball and some one quite a grand-looking man in uniform had asked me to dance and the band was playing that lovely new waltz that noel is always whistling and we were whirling round and round ah it was delicious and then something woke me and i remembered that i should never never dance as long as i live or run or play tennis or do any of the dear delightful things that other girls do and here poor molly wept afresh and waveney cried too out of passionate love and pity molly did not often have these weak moments for she was a bright creature and disposed to make the best of things every one had something to bear she would say with easy philosophy it was her cross the crook in her lot the thorn in her side one must not expect only roses and sunshine she would add but indeed very few roses had as yet strewn the twins path when molly had lumbered out of the room waveney folded her arms behind her and paced slowly up and down as though she were thinking out some problem that refused to be solved it was really two rooms divided at one time by folding doors but these had been taken away long ago it was a nondescript sort of apartment half studio and half sitting-room and bore traces of family occupation an empty easel and several portfolios occupied one front window in the other near the fireplace was a round table strewn with study books and work baskets molly's painting table was in the inner room a big comfortable-looking couch and two easy chairs gave an air of coziness and comfort but the furniture was woefully shabby and the only attempt at decoration was a picturesque-looking red jar in which corporal mark's flowers were arranged presently waveney stopped opposite the empty easel and regarded it ruefully it will only be another disappointment she said to herself with a sigh poor father poor dear father and he works so hard too something must be done we are getting poorer and poorer and noel has such an appetite what is the use of living in our own house and pretending that we are well off and respectable and all that and we are in debt to the butcher and the coal merchant and it is not father's fault for he does all he can and it is only because he loves us so that he hates us to work and then she sat down on the couch as though she were suddenly tired and stared dumbly at the vine leaves twinkling in the sunshine and her lips were closed firmly on each other as though she had arrived at some sudden resolution 
end of chapter one chapter two of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa nouchette carey chapter two monsieur blackie it would be argument for a week laughter for a month and a good jest for ever a corinthian a lad of metal a good boy king henry the fourth a shrill ear-piercing series of whistles of a peculiarly excruciating description broke in upon waveney's meditation she shook herself frowned ran her fingers through her short curly hair thereby causing it to wave more wildly than ever then ran downstairs the ground-floor room corresponded with the one above only the folding doors had not been removed and over them in a schoolboy's round hand roughly painted in red and gold was noel ward his study with a pleasing and serpentine ornamentation embellishing the inscription in vain had molly with tears in her eyes implored her father to obliterate the unsightly record an amused shake of the head only answered her leave it alone he would say it is only a nursery legend and does no harm when noel evolves another original ideal it will be time to erase it and so noel ward his study still sprawled in ungainly characters over the lintel as waveney entered the room with rather an offended air she saw the youthful student standing in the doorway he was a tall thin stripling of fifteen but looked older perhaps because he wore spectacles and had classical well-cut features and an odd trick of projecting his chin and lifting his head as though he were always on the lookout for celestial objects but notwithstanding this eccentricity and a cracked and somewhat high-pitched voice the heir of the wards was certainly a goodly youth well old storm and stress he observed with a derisive grin as he balanced himself skilfully on his heels between the folding doors so the pibroch roused you pibroch returned his sister wrathfully how often have i told you you bad boy that you are not to make this horrible din caterwauling is music compared to it or even a bagpipe out of tune it was my best and latest work returned noel regarding the ceiling disconsolately a farmyard symphony with roulades and variations of the most realistic and spirited description and would bring the house down at a penny reading at present we had only reached the braying solo but the chorus of turkey cocks with peacock movement would have created a sensation they have returned molly stealing softly behind him and treating him to a smart box on the ears but noel merely pinned her hands in a firm grasp and went on with his subject little interruptions of this sort did not disturb him in the least he rather liked them than otherwise nothing pleased him better than to get a rise out of his sisters for whatever virtues he possessed he certainly lacked the bump of veneration dear sweet molly with her angelic face was often addressed as old stick in the mud pegtop or the wobbly one while waveney his special chum the creature whom he loved best in the world next to his father was storm and stress a singular sobriquet evolved from her name and her sudden and sprightly movements for one is nearly blown away he would say there is always a breeze through the house when that girl is in it it is like playing a scale upside down and wrong side outwards to hear her coming downstairs and very often he would come to his meals with his collar up and flourishing a red silk handkerchief ostentatiously and speak in a croaking nasal voice until his father asked him mildly where he had caught such a cold and then waveney would nudge him furiously under the table on the present occasion poor molly was kept in durance vile until noel had finished his disquisition on his novel symphony then he released her and contemplated the tea-table with a fixed and glassy stare which conveyed mute reproach noel dear it is a fresh loaf she said hastily and apprehensively and it is beautifully crusty and the butter is good a penny a pound dearer and at the best shop 
where are the shrimps asked noel and he so lengthened the word that it sounded almost as terribly in mollie's ears as mrs siddons give me the dagger for so much depends on expression and if one is only melodramatic even the words shrimps can be as sibilant and aggressive as the hissing of snakes oh dear how tiresome you are noel returned mollie quite sharply for her for she was housekeeper and the strain and responsibility were overwhelming at times especially when her poor little purse was empty i could not afford them really noel she continued welling into tenderness at the thought of his disappointment there were some nice brown ones but i dared not get them for i had only tuppence left so i bought watercresses instead ask a blessing my child and i will forgive you and then much to his sister's relief noel subsided and began cutting the bread while under cover of the tablecloth waveney slipped sixpence into mollie's hand and made a movement with her lips suggestive of to-morrow and mollie nodded as she poured out the tea noel had a volume of eugene arum propped up before him as he ate but it did not engross him so utterly that he could not interpolate the conversation whenever he pleased and it pleased him to do so very often mollie was giving a graphic and heart-breaking account of the way in which she and her father had packed the precious picture and how it had been bumped three times while they carried it down the narrow stairs i quite miss the dear old thing wave she went on and the studio looked so dull without it noel was so absurd he threw an old shoe after it for good luck and it nearly knocked father's hat off and then he bolted indoors and there was father looking at me so astonished and he was not quite pleased i could see that so i said it is not me dad it is the other boy yes and it was real mean of you grumbled noel but there what are you to expect from a woman poor old padre he will be precious tired with hauling along king canute and it will bump all the worse going upstairs oh noel exclaimed both the girls in a shrill crescendo of dismay you don't really believe that the dealers will refuse king canute ejaculated mollie father has worked so hard at it and it is really his best picture noel shrugged his shoulders then he pointed his chin in an argumentative way the dealers buy awful rubbish sometimes but they won't buy this every kid knows how the old buffer gave his courtiers a lesson but no one wants to be always looking on while he does it the public hates that sort of thing you know i told father so over and over again but he would not listen why don't you try something lively and less historical i said to him the two grave diggers in hamlet or touchstone and audrey we might get corporal marks to sit for touchstone the public would think that fetching but no nothing but that solemn old dane would suit him the wards are terribly obstinate i am my father's son and speak feelingly and then noel shouldered his book and marched back to the study do you think noel is right whispered mollie he is very clever for all his ridiculous nonsense and i am not quite sure whether king canute will really interest people oh don't ask me returned waveney in an exasperated tone if only dear father would stick to his schools and his drawing classes and not try to paint these pictures they seem grand to us but they are not really well done don't you remember mr fullerton said so we were in the back room but we heard him plainly you are too ambitious ward that was what he said the public is tired of these old hackneyed subjects why don't you hit on something pathetic and suggestive some fetching little incident that tells its own story child and st bernard dog for example returned father grimly and right under it nelly's guardian would that do fullerton but i suppose anything would do for pot boilers oh yes i recollect returned mollie with a long-drawn sigh poor old dad how low he seemed that day and this evening if the waveney would not let her finish the sentence never mind that just now it is no use crossing the bridge till you come to it let us go upstairs and be cosy for i have a lot i want to say to you and then they went up arm in arm mollie was almost a head taller than her sister and sat down side by side on the big couch and then waveney began to laugh oh mollie i have had such an adventure i did not want noel to hear it because he would have teased me so unmercifully don't you recollect that horrid notebook that we found and then at the recollection mollie began to giggle and finally both she and waveney became so hysterical with suppressed mirth that they had almost to stifle themselves in the cushions for fear noel should hear them 
for it was only lately that they had become acquainted with the dark and machiavellian policy of that artful youth evening after evening as they had exchanged their girlish confidences noel had sat by them with a stolid and abstracted look apparently drawing pen and ink devils a favourite amusement of his but it was molly who found him out the adventures of waveney edna ward alias storm and stress was scrawled on the title-page and thereupon followed a series of biographical sketches profusely illustrated storm and stress with the bull of bashan a singularly graphic description of waveney's terror at meeting an angry cow in the lane number two storm and stress saving an orphan's life the orphan being a deserted half-starved kitten now an elderly cat rejoicing in the name of mrs muggins and so on every little incident touched up or finely caricatured in a masterly manner pere ward had been so charmed with this manifestation of his son's talent that he had carried off the notebook and locked it up amongst his treasures that boy will make his mark he would say proudly but we must give him plenty of scope and indeed it could not be denied that noel had a fairly long tether as soon as waveney could recover herself she sat up and rebuked molly severely for her levity for how is a person to talk while you are cackling in that ridiculous manner and it is really quite an interesting adventure and with an important air it is to be continued in our next and this sounded so mysterious that molly wiped her eyes and consented to be serious well you know began waveney in a delightfully colloquial manner father had told me to take the omnibus that would put me down at king street all the outside places were taken but there was only the usual fat woman with bundle and baby inside and presently a gentleman got in you know i always make a point of noticing my fellow-passengers as dad says it helps to form a habit of observation so i at once took stock of our solitary gentleman he was a little dark man very swarthy and foreign-looking and he wore an oddly shaped peaked sort of hat rather like guy fawkes without the feather and he had a black moustache that was very stiff and fierce so of course i made up my mind that he was a frenchman and probably an artist for though his clothes were good he had rather a bohemian look here waveney paused but molly gave her a nudge go on wave i am beginning to feel interested was he really french not a bit of it my dear for he talked the most beautiful english and directly he opened his mouth i found out he was a gentleman for his voice was perfectly cultured and so pleasant i rather took to him because he was so kind to the fat woman he held her bundle while she and her baby got out and he scolded the conductor for hurrying her i thought that rather nice of him so few young men trouble themselves about fat women and babies oh he was young in an appreciative tone well youngish two or three and thirty perhaps but now i am coming to the critical point of my story directly we were left alone the conductor came to ask for our fares he was a surly-looking man with a red face and his manner was not over civil most likely he resented the scolding about the fat woman well no sooner had monsieur put his hand in his pocket then he drew it out again with a puzzled look some one has picked my pocket he said out loud but he did not look so very much disturbed my sovereign purse has gone and some loose silver as well and then he searched his other pockets and only produced a card-case and some papers and then he began to laugh in rather an embarrassed way my good fellow you see how it is the beggars have cleaned me out five or six pounds gone confound those light-fingered gentry if i had not left my watch at the maker's it would have gone too that is all very well returned the conductor in a disagreeable voice but what i want to know sir is how am i to get my fare oh you will get it right enough replied monsieur but he was not monsieur at all only the name suited him but for the present i can only offer you my card and then he held it out with such a pleasant smile that it might have softened half a dozen conductors but old surly face was not so easily mollified i don't want your bit of pasteboard he growled do you call yourself a gentleman to ride in a public conveyance without paying your fare then the motto of the wards flashed into my mind open hand good luck and the next minute i produced a sixpence from my purse there were just two sixpences in it will you allow me to offer you this i said in my grandest manner but i felt a little taken aback when he lifted his hat and beamed at me i say beamed for it was really the most friendly jovial smile his whole face quite
crinkled up with it i could not refuse such a good samaritan a thousand thanks for your kind loan there sir handing over the sixpence sternly give me the change and next time keep a civil tongue in your head and then greatly to my surprise he pocketed the threepence i am in your debt for a whole sixpence he continued and i am as grateful to you as though you had returned my missing sovereigns is it not kingsley who points out the beauty and grace of helping lame dogs over stiles now will you add to your kindness by informing me of your name and address i stared at him blankly and i am afraid i blushed there is no occasion i said feebly at last sixpence is not a great sum and i was very glad to be of service for i could not help feeling how absurd it was making so much of a trifle but monsieur seemed indignant at this i could not be in debt to any young lady even for sixpence he said severely i was too well brought up for that and then of course i was obliged to tell him where i lived and he actually made me repeat it twice he was so anxious to remember it miss ward ten cleveland terrace chelsea he observed why that is just opposite the hospital i know it well strange to say i am staying in chelsea myself then he took out his card-case hesitated and grew rather red and finally put it back in his pocket my name is ingram he said rather abruptly and then the omnibus stopped and he handed me out i must be in your debt until to-morrow i fear were his parting words and oh molly do you really think that he will actually call and pay the sixpence of course he will and of course he ought returned molly excitedly oh wave what an adventure it was just like a bit in a novel when the hero meets the heroine only an omnibus is the last place for romance then waveney made a face no no molly little dark frenchified men are not my taste even if they have nice voices my private hero must be very different from monsieur blackie then a crackling laugh from behind the sofa made both the girls jump up in a fright and the next moment waveney looked not unlike her sobriquet as uttering dire threats of vengeance she flew round and round the room after the treacherous eavesdropper until noel exhausted by laughter subsided into a corner and submitted to be shaken monsieur blackie to be continued in our next exclaimed the incorrigible lad when waveney grew weary with her punitive exertions my word there must be a new note-book for this storm and stress enacting the part of good samaritan and here noel fairly crowed himself out of the room he has heard every word observed waveney in a dejected tone i am afraid we laughed too loud and that roused his curiosity oh dear what a boy he is and none of us keep him in order but molly was too exhausted to answer her end of chapter two chapter three of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa nuchette carey chapter three king canute comes back care to our coffin adds a nail no doubt and every grin so merry draws one out john walcott and nature swears the lovely dears her noblest work she classes oh her prentice hand she tried on man and then she made the lasses oh burns as the soft september twilight stole over the room the girls became more silent waveney seemed buried in thought and molly tired out with laughing nestled against her comfortably and very nearly went to sleep but she was roused effectually by waveney's next speech sweetheart her pet name for molly i am going to make you miserable i am afraid but i have been telling myself all day long that we must face the situation if father does not get a good price for his picture what are we to do but he must sell it returned molly in a distressed voice barker is getting disagreeable about his bill and his man says nasty things to anne when he leaves the meat and we owe chandler for two tons of coal yes i know and waveney sighed heavily those two tons have been on my mind all day you poor dear no wonder you looked tired 
ah how hateful and mean it is to be poor ah you are not as wicked and rebellious as i am wave i sometimes cry with the longing for the pretty things other girls have i cannot resign myself to the idea of being shabby and pinched and careworn all my life long if this goes on we shall be old women before our time when i am ordering dinner i feel nearly a hundred waveney stroked the glossy brown head that rested against her shoulder but made no other answer she was thinking how she could best break some unwelcome news to molly molly was emotional and cried easily and her father always hated to see one of his girls unhappy father would cut the moon up into little pieces and give them to us if he could she thought nothing is too good for us but when molly frets he takes it so to heart oh dear if only doing one's duty were made easier but there is no learning or reading without tears in the handbook of life and then she set her little white teeth together firmly as a child does when some nauseous medicine is offered molly dear i cannot keep it back any longer it makes me miserable to have a secret from you i have been to harley street to-day and talked to miss warburton and she has something on her books that is likely to suit me then the sob she dreaded to hear rose to poor molly's lips ah wave you can't really mean it this is worst of all it is positively dreadful how am i to live without you and father and noel what are they to do and here the tears rolled down her face but waveney who had been schooling herself all day refused to be moved from her stoicism molly please listen to me it is childish to cry do you remember our last talk the one we had in the lime walk and how we agreed that we must do all we could to help father but i do help him returned molly in a woe-begone voice i keep the house and mend things and look after that stupid clumsy anne and the fine art publishers seem to like my little drawings and i am never idle for a single instant no darling you put us all to shame do you think i am finding fault with you but you must not do it all that is just it and as mrs addison no longer requires me i must look out for another situation for during the past year waveney had acted as secretary to a lady living near them in chain walk it had only been a morning engagement and the pay had not been much but waveney and molly too had found immense pleasure in spending the scanty earnings of course i know you must do something returned molly rather irritably for even her sweet nature resented the idea of losing waveney as an insufferable injury but you might find something in chelsea no dear returned waveney gently i have tried over and over again and i can find nothing suitable i cannot teach i have never been educated for a governess and no one near us seems to want a secretary or reader or companion are you quite sure of that waveney quite sure i have been wasting two whole months waiting for something to turn up so this morning i made up my mind that i would see miss warburton she was so nice molly she is such a dear woman a little quick and decided in her manner what some people would call abrupt but when she gets interested in a person she is really quite soft and kind she heard all i had to say asked me a few questions and then turned to her book it is rather a lucky chance you came in this morning miss ward she said for a lady who called yesterday is in want of a young person who can read well and then she explained to me that this lady's sister was troubled at times with some weakness in her eyes that prevented her from reading to herself especially of an evening and that they required some pleasant lady-like girl who would make herself useful in little ways and the name waved me the name is harford and they live at the red house erpingham they are very nice people but at the present moment she is staying with some friends in berkeley square and she will interview me there oh dear you speak as though everything were settled no indeed no such luck miss warburton was very kind very sympathetic and anxious to help me but she advised me not to set my heart on it for fear i should be disappointed miss harford may think you too young yes i know as i was about to protest indignantly at this you are really nineteen but no one would think you were over seventeen 
isn't it humiliating molly that strangers will always think i am a child if only my hair would grow and not curl over my head in this absurd way people always take you for the eldest and you are to see miss harford to-morrow yes dear and you must get noel to throw another old shoe after me for luck then her lip trembled and her eyes grew misty dear do not make it harder for me than you can help don't you know how i hate to leave my old sweetheart i would rather stay at home and live on bread and water than fare sumptuously in other folks houses i feel as though i should die with homesickness and ennui oh it is no crying matter i assure you it is the rack and the thumbscrew and the burning faggots all in one and if you want a new martyr for the calendar and have any spare halos on hand i am your woman and then of course molly did as she was expected to do left off crying and began to laugh in the manner that often made her father call her his wild irish girl and indeed there was something very irish in molly's mercurial and impressionable temperament the next minute their attention was attracted by strange noises from below something heavy was being dragged along the passage accompanied by extraordinary sibilant sounds resembling the swishing and hissing of an ostler rubbing down a horse both the girls seemed to recognize the sounds for waveney frowned and bit her lip and molly said in a troubled tone oh it is poor old canute come back and then they ran into the passage and looked over the balusters noel and a little fair man in a shabby velveteen coat were hauling a large picture between them with much apparent difficulty one end had got jammed in the narrow staircase and noel's encouraging swishes and woe there steady old man keep your pecker up and don't kick over the traces might have been addressed to a skittish mare then he looked up and winked at his sisters and almost fell backwards in his attempt to feign excessive joy hurrah three cheers here we are again large as life and as heavy as the fat woman in mrs jarley's waxworks but what's the odds as long as you are happy as the lobster said as he walked into the pot hold your tongue noel returned his father good-naturedly it is your fault the confounded thing has got wedged keep it straight and we shall manage it well enough and then he looked up at the two faces above him there you are my darlings he said nodding to them you see i am bringing our old friend back we will have him up directly if only this young jackanix will leave off his monkey tricks and then in a singularly sweet tenor voice he chanted you hear that boy laughing you think it is fun but the angels laugh too at the good he has done the children laugh loud as they troop to his call and the poor man that knows him laughs loudest of all oliver wendell holmes whispered molly but waveney made no answer she only ran down a few steps and gallantly put her shoulder to the wheel and after a few more tugs king canute was safely landed in the studio where noel executed a war-dance round him with many a wild whoop after the manner of redskins father dear whispered molly in a delightfully coaxing voice sit down on grumps while i make your coffee for the ward family being somewhat original gave queer names to their belongings and since they were children the old couch had been called grumps tired hands and tired limbs and aching hearts always finding it a comfortable refuge so i will dear returned mr ward and then both the girls hung about him and kissed him and molly brushed back his hair and put a rose in his buttonhole but waveney only sat down beside him and held his hand silently there was no difficulty in discovering where noel got his good looks in his youth everett ward had been considered so handsome that artists had employed him to sit to them and for many years well-principled heads of girls colleges feared to engage him as drawing-master and even now in spite of the tired eyes and careworn expression and the haggardness brought on by the tension of overwork and late hours the face was almost perfect only the fair hair had worn off the forehead and was becoming a little grey pepper and salt molly called it but the thing that struck strangers most was his air of refinement in spite of his shabby coat and old hat no one could deny that he was a gentleman and in this they were right everard ward was a man who if he had mixed in society would have made many friends in the old days he had been dearly loved and greatly admired but just when his prospects were brightest and the future seemed gilded with success he suddenly took the bit between his teeth and bolted not downhill his mother's sweet memory and his own dignity prevented that but across country down side roads that had no thoroughfare and which landed him in bogs 
of difficulty for in spite of his soft heart and easy good nature everard was always offending people his wealthy godfather for example when he refused to take orders and to be inducted into a family living and again his sole remaining relative and uncle who wished him to go into the war office life is an awful muddle he would say sometimes but in reality he made his own difficulties his last act of youthful madness was when he left the stock exchange where an old friend of his father had given him a berth and had joined a set of young artistic bohemians at that time he was supposed by his friends to be on the brink of an engagement to an heiress he had seemed warmly attached to her until at a ball he met dorothy sinclair and fell desperately in love with her this was his crowning act of madness and when he married her his friends shook their heads disapprovingly and said to each other that that fool of a ward had done for himself now why the fellow must be imbecile to throw away a fortune and a good sort of woman like that to marry a pretty little girl without a penny for her dower and indeed though dorothy was a lovely young creature and as good and lovable as her own molly she was the last woman everard ought to have married the heiress would have made a man of him and he would have spent her money royally and been the best of husbands to her but dorothy lacked backbone she was one of those soft weak women who need a strong arm to lean upon and so when the children came and the cold cold blast of adversity began to blow upon them when everard could not sell his pictures and poverty stared them in the face then she lost heart and courage everard dearest i have not been the right wife for you she said once for that long fatal illness taught her many things oh i see it all so much more clearly now i have disheartened you when you needed encouragement and when our troubles came i did not bear them well you have been the sweetest wife in the world to me was his answer and then dorothy had smiled at him well pleased yes he had been her true lover and he was her lover to the last and when she died leaving three young children to his care everard ward mourned for her as truly as any man could do those were terrible years for him that followed his wife's death his twin girls were only ten years old and noel a pale-faced urchin of five he never quite knew how he lived through them but necessity goaded him to exertion he worked doggedly all day long coming home whenever it was possible to take his meals with the children sometimes some kind-hearted schoolmistress would tell him to bring one of his little girls with him and this was always a red-letter day for waveney and molly for the poor little things led a dull life until everard was able to send them to day school and after that they were quite happy he used to watch them sometimes as they went down the street with their satchel of books waveney would be dancing along like a fairy child with little springy jumps and bounds as though the sunshine intoxicated her and molly would hurry after her limping and lurching in her haste with her golden-brown hair streaming over her shoulders and her sweet innocent face lifted smilingly to every passer-by my sweet moll she is her mother's image everard would say to himself and his eyes would be a little dim for with all his faults and troubles and idiosyncrasies no father was more devoted his twin daughters were the joy and pride of his heart when he came home at night tired out with the long day's work the very sound of their voices as he put the latch-key in the door seemed to refresh and invigorate him here's dad here's dear old dad they would cry running out to meet him and then they would kiss and cuddle him and purr over him like warm soft young kittens noel would pull off his boots and bring him his slippers and then grumps would be dragged up to the fire and anne would be ordered to bring up the tea quick and then they would all wait on him as though he were a decrepit old man and noel who was a humorist even at that early age would pretend to be a waiter and say yes sir and no sir and next thing sir with an old rag of a towel on his arm to represent a napkin i saw ward the other evening a friend of his said one day to a lady he teaches drawing at welbeck college where i take the literature classes so i often see him and one evening he took me home with him to cleveland terrace poor old ward he was not cut out for a drawing-master he was always a bit flighty and full of whimsies and used to fly his kite too high in the old days but he made a fool of himself you know with that unlucky marriage indeed returned the lady quietly ah well that is all ancient history he has made his bed poor fellow and must just lie on it but i do so hate seeing a man's career marred especially if he is a good sort like ward 
and you went home with him observed his hearer in the same quiet tone yes and upon my word it was really a pretty little family picture there was ward looking like a sleepy adonis with his fair hair rumpled all over his head and two sweet little girls hanging on each arm and cooing over him and that fine boy of his lying on the rug with the picture i declare my snug bachelor rooms looked quite dull that night when anything ailed one of the twins everard's misery would have touched the most stony heart when molly had measles he nursed her night and day and when waveney and noel also sickened he was so worn out that if a kindly friend had not come to his assistance he would soon have been on a sick-bed happily it was holiday time and there were no schools or classes miss martin was a governess herself but with the divine self-abnegation of, of a good-hearted woman she gave up a pleasant visit to her country house to help poor mr ward women were always doing that sort of thing for everard ward but her little patience gave her a great deal of trouble molly cried and would not take her medicine from any one but father and waveney was pettish but noel was the worst of all miss martin was plain-featured and wore spectacles and noel who inherited his father's love of beauty objected to her strongly go away he said fretfully we don't want no frights and goggles and he began to roar so lustily that everard was roused from his sleep and came pale and weary and dishevelled to expostulate with his son and heir but noel who was feverish and uncomfortable repeated his offence we don't want no frights here dad tell her to go for shame noel returned his father sternly i am quite shocked at you this kind lady has come to help us and don't you know my boy that to a gentleman all women are beautiful please don't scold him mr ward returned miss martin good-naturedly but her sallow face was a little flushed noel and i will soon be good friends it is only the fever makes him fractious and as tact and good temper generally win the day the children soon got very fond of their dear marty as they called her and as they grew up she became their most valued friend and adviser until her death it was miss martin whose sensible arguments overcame everard's rooted aversion to the idea of girls working as long as i live i will work for them he would say but miss martin stuck to her point gallantly life is so uncertain mr ward an accident any day might prevent you from earning your bread you will forgive me for speaking plainly let them work while they are young but though everard owned himself convinced by her arguments it was a bitter day to him when waveney became mrs addison's secretary father would cut the moon up in little bits and give them to us waveney had said to herself and indeed to the fond foolish fellow no gift could have been too precious for those cherished darlings of his heart everard always told people that he loved them just alike and he honestly thought so and yet if waveney's finger ached it seemed to pain him all over and all the world knows what that means End of chapter three chapter four of molly's prints this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by laura riley molly's prints by rosa nuche carey chapter four the ward family at home and the night shall be filled with music and the cares that infest the day shall fold their tents like arabs and as silently steal away longfellow as soon as molly had left the room on household cares intent waveney lighted a small shaded lamp that stood on the table it was a warm evening and both the windows were thrown up the moon had just risen and the vine leaves that festooned the balcony had silver edges as waveney turned up the lamp she said cheerfully now we can see each other's faces and then she sat down again and slipped her hand in her father's arm tell me about it dad directly minute and then a smile came to mr ward's tired face for this was one of the family stock jokes that were never stale never anything but delightful and fresh and whenever one of his girls said it it brought back waveney in her baby days a tiny despot in red shoes with a head brimming over with curls 
stamping her little feet, and calling out in shrill treble, "'Directly minute! Miss Baby won't wait nohow!' "'There is nothing good to hear, little girl,' returned Mr. Ward, with a strained laugh. "'When you spell failure, spell it with a big F, my dear. That's all. But another skilful question or two soon drew forth the whole story. He had had a harassing, disappointing day. The dealers, who had sold one or two of his smaller pictures, refused to give King Canute house room. They could not possibly dispose of such a picture, they said. It was too large and cumbersome, and there were serious defects in it. One or two of the figures were out of the drawing. The waves were too solid, looking like molten lead. There was no finesse, no delicacy of execution. The coloring was crude. In fact, the criticism had been scathing. They were so rough on me that my back was up at last, went on Mr. Ward, and when Wilkes said I might leave it if I liked, and he would try and get a customer for it, I saw he was only letting me down a bit easier, and that he did not believe it would sell, so I just called a cab and brought it back. Waveney winced. All this cab hire could not be afforded. And then what were they to do? But the next moment she was stroking the worn coat sleeve tenderly, and her voice was as cheerful as ever. Dad, it is a long lane that has no turning, remember that, and it is no use fretting over spilt milk. Tomorrow we will get Noel to hang up dear old King Canute in that blank space, and if the stupid, cantankerous old dealers will not have anything to say to him, Molly and I will admire him every day of our lives. Molten lead, indeed, jerking her chin contemptuously. But Mr. Ward, who had been too much crushed to revive at once, only shook his head and sighed. In his heart he knew the dealers were right, and that the work was not really well done. The stormy sunset looked blotchy and unreal, and the solidity of the water was apparent, even to him. The whole thing was faulty, mawkish, amateurish, and futile. He had been in a perfect rage against himself, the dealers, and all the rest of the world as he clambered into his cab. He had had a rap upon the knuckles once too often. Well, he had learnt his lesson at last, but what a fool and dunce he had been! "'Take your punishment, my boy,' he had said to himself grimly. "'Write yourself, Everard Ward, U.A., unmitigated ass, "'and wear your fool's cap with a jaunty air. "'You wanted to paint a big historical picture "'to be something better than a drawing-master? "'Oh, you oaf, you dotard, you old driveler! To think that you could set the Thames on fire, that you could do something to keep your memory fresh and green. Go back to your watercolor landscapes, to your water wheels and cottages, your porches smothered in woodbine. You are at the bottom of your class, my lad, and there you will be to the end of the chapter. And then, for his imagination was very vivid, he saw himself an elderly man in his shabby greatcoat going out all weathers to his schools a little shrunk a little more hopeless and his girls his twin blessings but here the hot tears rose to his eyes and he bit his lips oh it was hard hard and it was for their sakes he had worked and toiled just then molly came with a little tray there was a tall curious old china cup on it which was known in the family as dives and was considered one of their choicest treasures when any one was ill the sight of dives
filled to the brim with fragrant coffee or delicious chocolate would bring a smile to pale lips as she placed the tray beside her father molly's face wore a triumphant air as though she would have said if any one could beat that cup of coffee or make better toast i should like to see her that's all thanks dearest returned her father gently but you have scorched your face my sweet moll oh that is nothing returned molly hastily putting up her hands to her hot cheeks she had been through all sorts of vicissitudes during the last half hour the water would not boil or the fire burn properly though she and noel had put a whole bundle of sticks into it and at every stick he had asked her a fresh conundrum have you told dad about monsieur blackie she asked and then waveney smiled no but i will presently when father has had his supper come out on the balcony a moment molly is not the moonlight lovely yes i do love these white nights returned molly ecstatically we used to call them silver nights when we were wee children those roofs look as though they were covered with snow and just see how nice our shabby old courtyard looks those privets are quite grand what an old dear the moon is wave she covers up all the little defects so nicely and glorifies all common things but waveney did not hear this little rhapsody neither had she called molly out to watch moonlight effects moll just listen to me a moment you must not say a word to father about harley street not one word molly looked at her blankly and why not wave oh dear not for worlds returned waveney earnestly he is so low so unlike himself to-night he had so set his heart on that poor old thing being a success but they have all been throwing stones at him and he is so hurt about it don't you know what noel always says you must not hit a man who is down those are school ethics but it is true dad is just like the brer rabbit to-night him lies low and we must just talk to him and make him laugh but wave surely and molly who was nothing but a big beautiful simple child looked quite shocked surely you cannot mean to see that lady without speaking to father but i do mean it molly of course i want to tell father i always long to tell him everything but it would be rank selfishness to-night it would be the last straw that terrible straw that breaks the camel's back and i know just what he would do he would not smoke his pipe and he would not sleep a wink and he would be like a wreck to-morrow when he goes to norwood no when it is settled it will be time enough to tell him and as usual molly submitted to her sister's stronger will waveney was the clever one she would say she saw things more clearly and she was generally right for molly thought nothing of herself and was always covered with blushes and confusion if any one praised her so waveney had her way and as mr ward smoked his pipe she told him all about monsieur blackie and then noel shut up his lesson books and came upstairs and the three young people sang little glees and songs unaccompanied and presently mr ward laid down his empty pipe and joined too and the girls voices were so fresh and clear and the man's tenor so sweet that a passer-by stood for a long time to listen every now and then an odd boyish voice with a crack in it chimed in like a jangling bell out of tune oh noel please do not sing so out of tune you are as flat as a pancake and as rough as a nutmeg grater isn't he moll and then waveney made a face at the unfortunate minstrel 
"'Don't come the peacock over me,' began Noel, wrathfully, for any remark on his cracked voice tried his temper. "'Hit one of your own size, miss.' "'Hush, hush, Noel,' observed his father good-humouredly. "'You will do well enough some day. "'Drink to me only with thine eyes. "'Let us sing that, my pets.' And then the voices began again, and the listener underneath the window smiled to himself and walked on. It was late, and Molly was yawning before the little concert was over, but when Mr. Ward went to his room that night, the weight of oppression seemed less heavy. Yes, he had been a fool, but most men make mistakes in their lives, and he was not so old yet, only forty-four, for he had married young. He would leave off straining after impossibilities and take his friend's advice, paint pot boilers in his leisure hours, and devote his best energies to his pupils. Cincinnatus went back to the plough, and why not Everard Ward? And then he wound up his watch and went to sleep. But long after the heavy-footed Anne had climbed up to her attic, breathing heavily and carrying the old black cat Mrs. Muggins in her arms, and long after Molly had fallen into her first sleep and was dreaming sweetly of a leafy wood where primroses grow as plentifully as blackberries, a little white figure sat huddled up on the narrow window seat, staring out absently on the moonlight. Waveney could see the dim roofs of the hospital. The old men were now asleep in their cabin-like cubicles, some of them fighting their battles over again, others dreaming of wives and children. After all, it must be nice to be old and to know that the fight is over, thought the girl a little sadly. Life is so difficult sometimes. When we were children we did not think so. I suppose other girls would have said we had rather a dull life. But how happy we were! What grand times we had that day at the zoological gardens, for example, and that Christmas when father took us to the pantomime. I remember the next day Molly and I made up our minds to be ballet dancers, and Noel decided to be a clown. And here Waveney gave a soft little laugh. Dear father, it was so good of him not to laugh at us. Most people would have called us silly children, but he listened to us quite seriously, and recommended us to practice our dancing sedulously. Only he would not hear of shortening our skirts. He said later on would do for that. Oh dear, oh dear, was it not just like him? And of course by the next Christmas we had forgotten all about it. But even these reminiscences, amusing as they were, could not long hinder Waveney's painful reflections. The idea of leaving home and going out into the world was utterly repugnant to her. She had told Molly, in playful fashion, that it was the rack and the thumbscrew and the faggots combined. But in reality, the decision had cost her a bitter struggle and nothing but the strongest sense of duty could have nerved her to the effort. Waveney's nature was far less emotional than Molly's, but her affections were very deep. Her love for her father and her twin sister amounted to passion. When she read the words, Little children, keep yourselves from idols, she always held her breath, made a mental reservation, and went on. If only people liked father's pictures, she sighed, and then another pang crossed her, as she remembered his tired face, how old and careworn he had looked, until they had sung some of his favorite songs, and then his eyes had become bright again. Dear old dad, how he will miss me! But when she thought of Molly, the lump in her throat seemed to strangle her. They had never in their lives been parted for a single night. And yet it is my duty to go, thought poor Waveney. 
we are growing poorer every day and it will be years before noel can earn much i'm afraid schools are falling off a little oh yes there is no doubt about it and i must go and waveney shed a few tears and then chilled and depressed she got into bed and molly turned over in her sleep and threw out her warm young arms it was delicious she murmured drowsily and oh wave why are you so cold darling what have you been doing but waveney only shivered a little and kissed her the next morning both girls rose in good time to prepare the early breakfast noel always left home at half past eight long ago an unknown friend of mr ward's had offered to pay his son's school fees and acting on advice he had sent the boy to st paul's he was a clever lad and in favor with all his masters he liked work and never shirked it but his pet passion was football he was fond of enlarging on his triumphs and gloried in the kicks he received it was understood in the family circle that he was to get a scholarship and go to oxford and of course a fellowship would follow the veiled prophet will expect it my dear molly would say at intervals when she was afraid he was becoming slack for under this figure of speech they always spoke of their unknown benefactor the whole thing was a mystery the solicitor who wrote to mr ward only mentioned his client vaguely an old friend of mr ward's is desirous of doing him this service and in succeeding letters my client has desired me to send you this check and so on the girls and noel who were dying with curiosity often begged their father to go to lincoln's inn and see mr duncan the firm of duncan and son was a good old-fashioned firm but mr ward always declined to do this if his old friend did not choose to divulge himself he had some good reason for this reticence and it would be ungrateful and bad form to force his hand he is a good soul you may depend on that was all they could get him to say but in reality he secretly puzzled over it it must be some friend of dorothy's he would say to himself there was that old lover of hers who went out to the bahamas and made his pal he married but he never had any children i do not mention his name to the youngsters better not i think but i have a notion it is carstairs he was a melancholy quixotic sort of chap and he was desperately gone on dorothy dad's a bit stiff about the prophet noel once said to his sisters but if i am in luck's way and get a scholarship i shall just go up to lincoln's inn myself and interview the old buffer and this seems so venturesome and terrifying a project that molly gasped and said oh no not really noel and waveney opened her eyes a little widely you bet i do returned noel cocking his chin in a lordly way i shall just march in as cool as a cucumber and as bold as brass i have come to thank my unknown benefactor sir i would say with my finest air for the good education i have received i have the satisfaction of telling you that i have gained a scholarship eighty pounds a year and that with the kind permission of of my occult and mysterious friend i wish to matriculate at balliol as i have now attained the age of manhood is it too much to ask the name of my venerable benefactor oh wave is he not ridiculous laughed molly but waveney looked at her younger brother rather gravely don't noel dear father would not like it but noel only shrugged his shoulders at this he had his own opinions about things and when he made up his mind it was very difficult to move him never were father and son more unlike 
and yet they were the best of friends. Mr. Ward always had a hard day's work on Tuesday. He had two schools at Norwood, and never came home until evening. The girls always took extra pains with the breakfast table on the Norwood days, and while Molly made the coffee, boiled the eggs, and superintended the toast-making, Waveney made up dainty little pats of butter and placed them on vine leaves. Then she went into the narrow little slip of garden behind the house and gathered a late rose and laid it on her father's plate. Waveney was in excellent spirits all breakfast time. She laughed and talked with Noel, while Molly sat behind her coffee pot and looked at her with puzzled eyes. How can Wave laugh like that when she knows, she knows? She thought, wonderingly, but at that moment Waveney looked at her with a smile so sweet and so full of sadness that poor Molly nearly choked and her eyes brimmed over with tears. End of chapter 4「Five of Molly's Prince. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Riley. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nuche Carey. Chapter Five. Fairy Magnificent. Leave no stone unturned. Euripides. What is useful is beautiful. Socrates. Wish me good luck, and do not expect me until you see me, were Waveney's last words, as Molly stood at the door with a very woe-begone face. Cheer up, Ma. Care killed the cat, you know. And then she waved her hand and vanished. It was still quite early in the afternoon when she reached Berkeley Square. In spite of her assumed cheerfulness, her courage was at a low ebb. The imposing appearance of the houses awed her. She knocked timidly, and the butler who opened the door looked like a dignified and venerable clergyman. He received her affably, as though she were an expected guest. Miss Hartford was out driving, but would be back shortly. His mistress, Mrs. Mainwaring, had desired that Miss Ward should be shown into the drawing-room. Waveney never felt so small and insignificant in her life. For the first time, she was conscious of a wish to be tall, as she followed him down the corridor. Then the thickness of the carpets distracted her, and the cabinets of china. Then a door was opened, and she heard her name announced, and a soft little voice said, "'Certainly, Druce, show the young lady in.' For one moment Waveney hesitated. The owner of the voice seemed invisible. It was a beautiful room, grander than anything the girl had ever seen, and it was full of sunshine and the scent of flowers. Tall palms were everywhere, and china pots with wonderful Japanese chrysanthemums, and there were screens and standard lamps, and a curtained archway leading to an inner room. And here Waveney at last discovered a tiny old lady, half buried in an immense easy chair. She was the prettiest old lady in the world, but as diminutive as a fairy. Her cheeks were as pink as Molly's, and she had beautiful silvery curls under her lace cap. A mass of white, fleecy knitting lay on her satin lap, and the small wrinkled fingers were loaded with costly brilliants. Fairy Magnificent, Waveney named her when she was retelling the account of her visit. She looked up with a pleasant smile and pointed to a chair. You have called to see my niece, Miss Harford. Oh yes, she is expecting you, but she was obliged to pay a business visit. My nieces are busy women, Miss Ward. Perhaps you will find that out for yourself some day. Waveney began to feel less shy. She looked around the room, 
that she might describe it properly to Molly. How Molly reveled in that description afterwards. It was like a page in a storybook. Flowers and statues and palms and that beautiful old lady in her satin gown. Fairy Magnificent was evidently fond of talking, for she rippled on, in her soft voice, like a little purling brook, knitting all the time. Oh, we all have our gifts, my dear, but I am afraid in my day girls were terribly worldly. It was not the fashion to cultivate philanthropy or altruism, as they call it. I recollect a young man asking one of my nieces if they went in for slumming. I wonder what we should have thought of such a question when I was young. Does Miss Harford do that sort of thing? asked Waveney, with something of her old animation. She was such a dear little old lady, like a piece of Dresden china. Oh, not slumming exactly. They are too sensible to take up every passing craze. But they do an immense deal of good. They have a home for governesses and broken-down workers very near them at Erpingham, and they have a room in the garden where they do all sorts of things. They have Thursday evenings for shop girls, regular social evenings, tea and music and talk, and the girls are as nicely behaved as possible. Oh, what a grand idea! And Waveney's eyes began to gleam and sparkle. I have always been so sorry for shop girls. I think they have such a hard, pushing sort of life. The poor things are often so tired, but they have to look pleasant all the same. Mrs. Mainwaring looked amused at the girl's energy, but before she could reply, there were quick, decided footsteps in the outer room, and the next moment a tall, dark woman in a walking dress entered. When Waveney rose from her chair, the lady looked at her with extreme surprise. Miss Ward, I suppose, and her manner was a little brusque. Please sit down again, and I will speak to you directly. Aunt Sarah, may I have the carriage, please? Morris says the horses are quite fresh. I find the letter that I expected is at the Red House, so it will be better for me to talk it all over with Althea. Do as you like, returned Mrs. Mainwaring, tranquilly, but you must attend to this young lady first, you know. And then Miss Harford took a seat near Waveney. The girl was suffering from a sense of painful disillusion. Mrs. Mainwaring's talk had given her a favorable idea of Miss Harford, but when she saw her, her first thoughts were, what a grievous pity that such a good woman should be so plain. But the next moment she added, plain is too mild a term. She is really quite ugly. And it could not be denied that Dame Nature had treated Miss Harford somewhat churlishly. Her figure was angular and a little clumsy, and not even her well-cut tailor-made tweed could set it off to advantage. Her features were strongly marked, and her complexion sallow, and her low forehead and heavy eyebrows gave her a rather severe look. She could not be less than forty, probably a year or two over that, but there was no affectation of youth, either in dress or manner. Perhaps the only point in her favor was a certain frankness and sincerity in her expression that, after a time, appealed to people. And yet her eyes were a light, cold gray. Strangers seldom took to her at first. Her quick, decided manners were rather too brusque, and then her voice was so harsh and deep, but they soon found out that she was to be trusted, and by and by they grew to love her. Doreen Harford always spoke of herself as the ugly duckling, who would never change into a swan in this world. I never do anything by halves, she would say, laughing, and her laugh was as fresh and ringing as a child's, though perhaps a little hard. I am as ugly as they make them, my dear, for she was too happy and busy a woman to fret over her lack of beauty, though she adored it when she found it, 
and petted all the pretty children and animals. "'There's Aunt Sarah,' she would go on. "'Is she not like one of Watteau's shepherdesses? "'Did you ever see anything so fine and pink and dainty? "'And she is seventy-three. "'She has had lovers by the score, "'and she was only a young woman when General Mainwaring died. "'But she would never marry again, bless her.' When Miss Harford sat down, she pulled off her gloves in rather a disturbed manner. I was sorry to keep you waiting, but I had to go out on urgent business. You are very young, Miss Ward, younger than I expected, and then Miss Warburton led me to suppose. She spoke in a slightly aggressive voice, as though Miss Ward were somehow to blame for her youthful aspect. That will mend in time, Doreen, my love observed mrs mainwaring kindly i think miss ward seems a very sensible young lady and then waveney longed to hug her i am nineteen she said looking miss harford full in the face that is not so very young after all and i have acted as secretary to a lady in shane walk it was only a morning engagement certainly but miss warburton knows all about me and she thought this situation would just suit me. I am fond of reading aloud, and I never get tired, and... Doreen, if you do not engage this young lady, I think I shall. But Mrs. Mainwaring was only joking, as her niece knew well, for it would have been more than her life was worth to do such a thing. For Fairy Magnificent had a faithful maid who simply worshipped her, and would have fought any woman who offered to do her service. Her mistress wanted no paid companion as long as she was in the house, she would say, and as Rachel ruled her mistress, and indeed the whole household, there was little probability of her indulging in this luxury. Miss Harford's face brightened. She understood the purport of her aunt's little joke. She liked Miss Ward and wished her niece to engage her. Althea will not mind her being young, she said significantly, and then Miss Harford turned to Waveney. Miss Warburton will have given you some idea of the duties required, and now her manner had decidedly softened. We are very busy people, and we lead two lives, the working life and the social life, and as we are fairly strong, we manage to enjoy both. Unfortunately, my sister has had a little trouble with her eyes lately. The doctors say it is on the nerves. Sometimes when she reads or writes, she has pain in them and has to close her book or shut up her desk. If she were to persevere, the pain would become excruciating. It is certainly on the nerves, for sometimes she is not troubled at all. I understand, returned Waveney in a low voice. Our doctor is an old friend and a very sensible man, continued Miss Harford, and he proposed that my sister should find some young lady with a good voice and pleasant manner who would read to her, especially in the evenings, when nothing is going on, and to whom she could dictate letters. Oh, I am sure I could do that, returned Waveney eagerly, and then Mrs. Mainwaring chimed in again. My dear... I am an old woman, so you may believe me. My nieces are the best women I know, and they make everyone happy at the Red House. Now, Aunt Sarah, returned Miss Harford good-humouredly, how are Miss Ward and I to understand each other if you will keep interrupting us? You see, Miss Ward, the duties are very light, and you will have plenty of time to yourself. We want someone young and cheerful who will make herself at home and be ready for any little service. Are you musical? I can sing a little, but my voice has not been well trained. That is a pity. Now, should you mind reading us a page or two? And she handed her a novel that was lying open on the table. Waveney flushed, but took the book at once. For the first few minutes, her voice trembled, then she thought of the new gown she wanted to buy for Molly at Christmas, and then it grew steady. Miss Ward reads very nicely, does she not, Aunt Sarah? was Miss Harford's approving comment. 
I think Althea will be pleased. Then, turning to Waveney with a pleasant smile that lit up her homely features as sunshine lights up a granite rock, I really see no reason why we should not come to terms. I do not know what we ought to offer you, Miss Ward, but my sister thought fifty pounds a year. Waveney gave a little start of surprise. The terms seemed magnificent. Oh, she said impulsively, I shall be able to help father. What happiness that will be! And then her face fell a little. Will you tell me, please, is it very far to Erpingham? Do you mean from here? No, not exactly. I am thinking of my own home. We live in Cleveland Terrace, Chelsea. Then Miss Harford seemed somewhat taken aback. Is your father's name Everard Ward? she asked abruptly. Oh, yes, have you heard of him? returned Waveney, naively. He is an artist, but his pictures do not sell, and he has only his drawing lessons. That is why I want to help him, because he works so hard and looks so tired, and Molly, that is my sister, is a little lame and cannot do much. Is that all your family? You do not speak of your mother. Miss Harford was looking at the girl a little strangely. She is dead, returned Waveney in a low voice. She died when Molly and I were ten years old, but there is a younger brother, Noel. Then Miss Harford turned to her aunt. Aunt Sarah, I really think it would be best for Althea to see Miss Ward herself. You know I have to drive over to Erpingham now. It is quite early in the afternoon, she continued, looking at Waveney. Can you not come with me? We shall be at the Red House in three-quarters of an hour. I could drop you at Sloan Square Station by seven. It will be a pleasant drive, and the evenings are still light until eight. Waveney hesitated. What would Molly say to her long absence? But then... Her father never returned home before eight on his Norwood days. The drive tempted her, and then the idea of seeing Erpingham. "'If you are sure that I shall be back by seven, she said, and then Miss Harford rang the bell and ordered the carriage. "'Althea will give us tea. Come, Miss Ward.' And then Mrs. Mainwaring held out her soft little hand to the girl. "'Good-bye, my dear.' You will be as happy as a bird at the Red House. Give my love to Althea, Doreen, and tell her to rest her poor eyes. Waveney thought of Cinderella and the pumpkin coach as she stepped into the luxurious carriage. The novelty of the position, the enjoyment of the swift, smooth motion, and the amusement of looking out at the crowded street completely absorbed her and for some time Miss Harford made no attempt to draw her into conversation. But presently she began to talk, and then Waveney found herself answering all sorts of questions about herself and Molly, how they amused themselves, and why her father's pictures did not sell. And then Waveney, who was very girlish and frank, told her all their disappointment about King Canute, and Miss Harford listened with such kindly interest that Waveney felt grateful to her. Father was so low and cast down about it last night, he said he should never have the heart to paint a picture again, because the dealers were so hard on him, and I'm afraid he meant it, too. Oh, what a nice gray church! And actually, we are coming to a river! Oh, how picturesque those reddish-brown sails look in the sunshine! This is Dareham, returned her companion. It is not such a very long drive, is it? In little more than ten minutes we shall have reached our destination. And then she began pointing out various objects of interest. Another church, the shops in High Street where they dealt. Then a high, narrow house, very dull and gloomy-looking. Some dear old friends of ours live in that house, she said. It is not very inviting-looking, is it? Once they lived in such a beautiful place, until old Mr. Shater lost his money. I am always so sorry for them. 
I think troubles of this kind fall very heavily on some natures. Waveney assented to this, but the subject did not much interest her. They had left Dareham behind now, and before them lay a wide green common with pleasant roads intersecting it. A little clear pool by the roadside rippled in the sunlight. Near it was a broad, grassy space shaded by trees. Two or three nurses sat on benches, and some children were dancing hand in hand, advancing and retreating, and singing in shrill little voices, Here we go gathering nuts in May. They were chanting, and then one child fell down and began to cry. Across the common there were soft blue distances, and a crisp wind, laden with the perfumes of firs and blackberries, fanned their faces. Then they drove through some white gates. A lodge and a long, shady lane were before them, with long, park-like meadows on one side. It was all so sweet, so still and peaceful in the evening light, that Waveney was half sorry to find that their journey was at an end. For the next moment the carriage stopped, and the lodge-keeper opened some more gates, curtsying with a look of pleasure when she saw Miss Harford. "'I have not come home to stay, Mrs. Monkton,' observed Miss Harford with a friendly nod, and then the horses began frisking down a winding carriage drive. The shrubbery was thick, but every now and then Waveney had glimpses of little shut-in lawns, one with a glorious cedar in the middle, and another with a sundial and a peacock. An old red brick Elizabethan house was at the end of the drive, with a long sunny terrace round it. At the sound of the wheels, two little Yorkshire terriers flew out to greet their mistress with shrill barks of joy. "'Oh, what pretty little fellows!' exclaimed Waveney. "'Yes, they are great pets.' Fuss and fury, that is what we call them, returned Miss Harford, smiling, and I think you will allow that the names suit them. End of chapter 5